Hello there, Sherman again. Boy, would these go on and on and on. I hope you're enjoying them. This is number 18. Just getting my materials ready here. <laughs> Covered so many things. I got sheets all over the place. But I'm getting my sheet together, no pun intended. Uh, this being number 18, I'm going to shoot for 20. I'm going to try to get two more after this. That'll be in a week's time, I hope, and we'll have all the sheets, uh, as I say, together and the links to them so you can follow everything I'm saying, and I, and I hope this works for you. Um, I've really enjoyed doing it. I want to say that up front. Uh, again, I'm coming to you from Tempo Trend Studios in Victoria, B.C., and uh, we're uh, coming into the better weather now, so I know a lot of you will be distracted. Uh, the freedom coming from COVID lessening, we hope. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we will have, have, have established some really good things here and planted some seeds that in uh, maybe years to come you'll find will serve you well. I, I hope so. That would, that would make me feel good if, if this uh, effort were to, to yield fruit. So let's look at um, tonight I want to cover uh, one of the overlooked a aspects of this, uh, we've done so much with uh, transposable and movable shapes, is the open position licks. And I'm going to confine it to the key of G and give you some nice ones. Uh, again, the sheets will be posted here as an example. This is called Intermediate Blues Lines Hot Fills. I'll put that one up for you. And I give you a whole bunch of G ones here. And, and I have uh, some for C and D. D7 as well, C7, D7. It's almost uh, synonymous. It could be G with a little bit of sass. So that's why I, I link them together. These are some of the best ones I've stolen from uh, bluegrass sources and other folk blues and other things. And I think it'll fill in nicely. So behind form one, you've got a nice little area here. And when you're playing around those chords, now these chords tend to be with the open strings and everything, they have a different flavor to them than the closed ones. And there are times when you really want to get down there and just get in the corner and use some of those things. More often in keys of E and A because you've got the open tonalities of the strings. But even so, uh, our G Blues has some nice little moves you can, you can, uh, you can adapt to uh, the fact that you have the open G string, for example. It's one of the things that adds a little bit of flavor, a unique flavor to a G blues you don't get from just playing your closed positions. So uh, this will be posted, as I said, and I'll have the other one. So there'll be two sheets, one with all G, one with half C, and one D. Should give you enough uh, good ideas to enhance that G blues that we've spent so much time on. Not the G minor blues, but the G blues, regular G blues. So let me play a few of these for you, and uh, then we'll move on to some other goodies that I have for you. So if you do a little looper with some G, just drop your G or G7, however you want to do it, you know. Here's an example of some of these. Watch my fingerings, they're not gospel, they're not carved in stone, but try my way. Try the way that I've done it. And sometimes you'll think, well, why wouldn't he use another finger? It's because I'm usually thinking of what comes next. Fingering for me is like, it's like shooting pool. You can just smack the balls and hope the cue, uh, cue ball is not sewed up. If you know anything about pool, you know how frustrating that can be. So you want to have, you want to plan your cue ball for the next shot. That's sort of my analogy I'm drawing here is that I would like to be in position for the next, to facilitate the next move. And if I find if I just use any old finger or if I use one finger to the exclusion of the others, I'm... I'm uh, forcing the team to play shorthanded, you know, sort of uh, in hockey, you know, when you have one guy in the box. So I kind of want to use everybody. And I know some of you guys don't use your pinky that much. Fortunately, I don't have too much of that going on here, but, but try to use everybody. That's my advice. When it, when it works, when it makes sense. Uh, Chet Atkins used to always say, if you play something long enough, the best fingering will occur to you. So you'd be prepared to go through a few uh, uh, incarnations of any song, of any solo or anything, before you find the one that's truly the best. And it, it depends on your hand, too. Okay, so G again. So here's a couple. You can play a chord in between. That's number one. Number two. Four. Oh, 
sorry, I jammed up there. Number five. Sorry, I gotta read here. Number six. Number seven. so on. So you'll get the gist of them and you can kind of throw those in and, and get some flavors that you normally wouldn't have. And the, in a similar way, C has uh, possibilities that you want to, that you want to explore. So uh, here's a couple of them from C. So put a loop of C down for yourself and then go number two. in there instead of going it's even around a cowboy C chord it's those half step notes the chromatics that make it so anyway there's a bunch of those and there's a D this one you have to kind of roll I have this um, antiseptic the uh, sauce that we use to keep our hands disinfected and it's got me my fingers sticky here so pardon me on this anyway if I'm not thinking about it I can slide off just fine but if I get there it's like gorilla snot or whatever they call that stuff so you can hear I put some sass in these these aren't just uh, kitty licks they're nice ones so if you can work these in around the corners of your other scales I think you'll have some fun. So let's see what that sounds like if I play a G blues and I'll integrate some of these for you. So let's see, not too fast. It's usually 80, so I'll go around 70. Okay, here we go. just a sample of playing into the corners with some of these licks and for some of you rockers you never explore that it's kind of you get this phantom note effect because you you get a free note and it kind of throws you off and you, you wonder and if you're playing in C you're coming around the corner but once you get the hang of it they're kind of fun and they lend a different flavor okay so that's another thing that you can put into your bag of tricks. Now we're moving into, I'll move these out of the way, moving into, excuse me, leaving frame here, um, advanced chords. I didn't want to get too far along here, excuse me, toward number 19 and 20. Number 20 I'll try to do a, a summary, I, I think I said, and uh, address some uh, questions for your future. And number 19, I have another goodies. I want to give you any clues. I want to keep you in suspenders about that. Uh, but uh, in the future, you're going to be looking at chords. The uh, purpose of these lessons was more for improvising to get you up there. But 
you're going to be a better improviser if you play better chords. And if you understand the chords and what constitutes uh, the motion that goes through chords, I hinted at that when I talked about the diatonic row, that chords have a gravitational field that pulls them toward each other and through each other, wanting to return to the source. Well, I wanted to do the best chord sheet that ever was, and I don't know if I've achieved it, you can comment on it. I put them in three categories, ones that have the root, root note, the name on the sixth string, root six chords, ones with the root on the fifth string, root five chords, and root four. And as you go down the row of these, instead of just memorizing a whole bunch of chords, which would be a daunting task, and you see these books, 40,000 guitar chords or something, I had those on my shelf. I never cracked them. They got more dust than anything else. And if I did look up a chord, it, it was so convoluted that upon analyzing it, I realized that technically it is a, a C demolished chord or whatever it was, or a, a G demented or whatever the thing was. I couldn't find a way to segue that to the next chord because the shape, the balance of notes uh, from the root to its, uh, its support beams, shall we say, uh, was such that the, the notes within the chord didn't blend to the next chord. So there were no lines of continuity. And so you'd have a nice line of continuity and then you get this chord dropped in which had no connection to the previous ones. That bugged me and still bugs me to this day. So in short, the chords that I put on here were ones that are time tested and that sound good uh, going from chord to chord. So they have, a, they have a fluidity and they have a logic, shall we say, with the voicings that I give you. There are many other ways to phrase chords, and I, I know I can make ten sheets, but I wanted one that you could, you could uh, copy and put in your guitar case and refer to. Have I achieved it? You be the judge. So let me just give you an example here, okay? So in the root six, play the first chord, pick a, pick a root. They could be any fret you want, okay? So... I could, I'll start on the, on the uh, G, since we're in G. I'll grab the G major, then I'll go down here. There's a G major seventh. The fingering, there's no open strings here. Explains that up there. So dampen any notes that are, that are not, uh, there's no zeros. These are fully movable chords. Um, then when you get to seven, sometimes I'll give you two of them because the bar chord G7 is, in this case, the one that everybody knows but the one that most jazz guys play and that has a, a logic to it is this one. So which one do I favor? Depends on what I'm playing. I like them both. Okay, that's why I gave you both. So that you can see there's a bracket around that one. Then as you keep going down, there's a G6. Well, we just did the G6 in some previous things. I'm gonna be doing it in just a minute here. I'm gonna show you uh, secondary blues in G. So that's the third fret, fourth fret, uh, sorry. 3rd fret, 6th uh, string, 2nd fret, 4th uh, string, 4th fret, 3rd string, and 3rd fret, 2nd string. Try to say that fast. Okay, so I'm going to go down here and let's see if you can hear there's a secret little melody in here. So chording can contain a solo element. Oh boy. So they always talk about chord me melody playing on the guitar. When you're playing chords, you can voice them in ways that secretly plays a little melody, so let me demonstrate that. So here's G, that everybody knows. Pivot on that to get your G major 7. And don't, no open strings like I just did. Can you hear the melody going through that? Now if you're playing uh, finger style, which I purposely avoided for these lessons, because I'm going to delve into that when I return with a vengeance to show you all my finger style con concepts, I tried purposely to avoid that because I wanted to focus on something that will help you with your soloing to bring it up to that next level. So, uh, but when you're doing a finger style, you can voice it a little better and find those notes within the chords better than you can just scraping. But I'm going to avoid that temptation. I'm tempted. G to G major seven. There's a little melody going on. Okay, so. So if I did a finger style, you can kind of hear it moving along. If you go to G7, I'm going to use the new one, which for many of you which will be a new shape. You can do it here, but I'll use this new one. First finger takes the root.
just played an, a melody which you could use in backing people to secretly solo. So you could have... And then... I almost went to the sixth, I got ahead of myself. The next chord is the sixth, so you see I can leave these two fingers down and go... Those are called guide fingers when you have a happy accident, a serendipitous fingering that transfers some of its members to the next chord. Take that, saves you time. So now you have a melody of four notes. If you can hear it. I'll do it uh, finger style one more time. Now over in the corner uh, of this sheet, down here I put a few miscellaneous chords, the augmenteds down here. Uh, they are really important because they form the cement for some of these, and in this case the sixth. to G. Then we go to G, cowboy G. So now we have a melody of... So when you're backing somebody, you don't have to just go... You could go... You're playing a secret little melody. Now what if I skipped the seventh and went to G6th? songs that have in the melody secretly contained within the chords while something else is going on. It could be a could be some crazy little little riff, but the chords are going so you can hear it. Just think, chording can be a lot more fun then, right? Because you're able to play little melodies that move the chord progression along. Just think of that. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, this is just a plan to see, but I'm giving you the full sheet, and I hope it comes through on the printout so you can see everything. That's a lot of knowledge of chords, but you'll see all your favorites there. You'll see the Jimmy chord, so-called. We should all be so influential that we get our own chord named for ourselves. And there's a chord right next to it, so that's E7 sharp 9. Could be anything, but I put it on the 7th fret. Right next to it is E flat 9. Right? Now, any of these chords that don't sound too good to you on the first playing, be brave, don't back off, because you can hear the melody. Where does it want to go? Oh, what does it ever want to go to A minor 7? Can you hear the melody? So. Wouldn't that be nice? So. secretly playing a melody in the chords. When I, when I finally realized this after I was getting uh, deeper into the chordal concepts and sifting through the mountains of chords that, that just didn't seem to satisfy, and I was playing in bands and trying to upgrade my chord knowledge, I found that the ones that really uh, sounded best were the ones that built a bridge to the next chord, and that's hence this thing was born. Uh, my concept of chording. So I think of the top note as like the roof of the house, the analogy. That should speak to you. The bass should be the one you want that says, not always the root. It doesn't always have to be G if you're on G or A. Sometimes there are root mo motions that move. This sheet does not address that. And that's a more advanced concept where you have chords moving with bass lines. That happens a lot in music. But first, walk before you run get these chords down to where you can move the voices within the chords. So the analogy here again, the house, you've got the foundation, that's the bass note, the root. The upper, the peak is your melody, and in between are the support beams. So those are the ones, and you'll notice when you look at these, like if you look at this G7, 
the new one that you just presented here, you just been presented with, it has a root, it has a nice little melody, and guess what, it has a tritone in the middle, which we talked about before, right? So there you go. So that, it doesn't get any better than that for having a simple chord that any human can grab with four fingers. You've got a melody. And if you, you finger it differently, you could... I can even skip if I'm doing finger style. stuck with that one thing again don't think of chords as just uh, things carved in stone these are these are fluid entities that could be molded to shape to to shape to fit your circumstance but the same theory applies I think you will find time will tell have a good strong bass note a root note have some good support beams and move the melody on the top you can't go wrong I think you'll enjoy it okay so to conclude this lesson, and I have to really hit this hard and fast, I've recorded a blues with an outside chord in it. Gosh, I do that all the time. And this uses the snake charmer scale again. So what we have here is an outside chord, in this case in our G blues that we love so much. And on this sheet called Secondary Blues in G, I hope you can see it, this will be posted. I just wrote this up the other night because I wanted this to be fresh off the press to show you that you don't have to do some abstract thing to make a standard G blues sound nice. So you can see I put a few new wrinkles in this. I'll probably review this again in uh, lesson 19 just to hit it one more time since today I won't have time to really go through it too much but I'll get it on the board with you. We have an E7 chord in there and that's where your snake charmer comes in. So for this snake charmer on, on this one, I'm going to use primarily this. Which, if I recall, was the first one on our minor blues sheet. We did it for D, but we'll move it up to E. Okay, so I have it here ready to play. I hope it will play for you. And I'm going to use the regular science, but every time there's an E7, I'm going to, I'll am going to i give you a look that I'm doing this thing, okay? So here we go. Hope my hat doesn't go flying off here. There she comes. There's your C ninth. Now we're back in a G, E7, A minor seven, D seven. Now the turnaround is interesting. E seven, so there's a couple E sevens. Here I go, G. I didn't give you a lot of time today, but hopefully you'll get this on the board. You can work at it. If you're following these week by week, you've got a week to kind of assimilate it. But in short, 
on the, the usual rules apply, so I'm not giving anything new, I'm not sneaking anything in on you. But first one, you got the nice G6 chord we talked about. You can go to your C9, it's nice. And the other ones are just your standard chords. I avoided using any jazz harmonies or any crazy stuff. But when you get to second line, it's the same as always, but G, and then you've got a full bar of E7 there. Try to use that harmonic minor scale, Snake Charmer, for that bar. If you're doing, you make a loop of this, and then do a bar of A minor 7, D7, G major scale works just fine. Okay? And you can use some arps on it if you like. But here is tricky. You get two seconds of G6, and then you've got to get a little snippet of the E7, and then you're back home again. So coming off the G, my only advice there would be... See how I did that? Here's a G, little G triad. And then when you're... You can just, you only have a couple seconds, so you could go, that would work just fine for E7. And then by that time you're in A minor or whatever you're into. So make those connections from G to E, and next time I will review this for you. So I'll just give you a few more ideas. Here's G if you're playing up in form 4 or around the 7th fret. To go to E, you can do the E here. You don't want to go to that, though. You want to go, which is the next column beyond the one we just did. So you can you can go as far east as you want to, but you can come up. Did you see what I did there? I came off the G scale. chromatic note, a half step note to approach. And then the E is here. I did a little arp on E. Then I did the snake charmer and trailed off. So and then you're on your way. So it's those little hazards in the road that can drive you nuts. But you can see what a nice sound that is to take a standard blues and just inject a few outside chords and it, it works out pretty darn good. So I think you'll have some fun with that. Uh, it shouldn't be too challenging, but we'll post that up as soon as we can. And that's called the Secondary Blues in G, I named it, because it contains that secondary dominant uh, E7. And uh, that again is the infamous, and I write on this side, the infamous or famous, however you feel it, 6-7. Uh, so in the key of G, the 6 is almost, you know, it's supposed to be a minor, but quite often you'll see an E7, and that's a secondary dominant that's very colorful. Use the Snake Charmer scale, you'll be fine, okay? So I hope that uh, wraps this up. Uh, next week we'll be on number 19, and then follow up with number 20 and wrap this series. And uh, so with that, tonight I say namaste. Good night.